Hi guys, my name's Johnny and I run Banquist. Now I'm here in Bruton, Somerset to film with a fantastic chef in a beautiful location. We're up in Ossip to film with Merlin Lebron Johnson. Merlin's trained classically in France, Belgium and Switzerland before coming here to open Ossip. And it's a menu that is devoted and dictated by the British seasons growing its own food just out the back here. Now it's one of Michelin star and I'm sure there'll be many more to follow. Can't wait to get cooking. Hi guys, I'm Merlin Labron Johnson and we're in Osset, which is my Michelin starred restaurant in Bruton, Somerset. Um, so we're a pretty simple restaurant where we, um, we grow a lot of our own produce, vegetables, fruit and herbs, and that kind of forms the basis for the, uh, you know, the ingredients and the structure of our menus, which kind of change from day to day. So these three dishes here are a really good example of the way that we treat our ingredients. We're starting off with a lovely um, compote of rainbow chard with some smashed chickpeas, a lovely creamy uh, burrata cheese and some fresh basil. Here you have a ribeye of Hereford beef, with some roasted sweet Florence onions, um, a salsa made from last year's preserved walnuts, parsley, uh, some watercress, some roasted country style potatoes, and here you've got a panna cotta made from sheep's milk, some fresh seasonal strawberries, a little bit of lemon thyme, and a crumble made with olive oil. Here at Banquist, we like to provide you with the very best seasonal ingredients. So let's go through it now. We've got some beautiful uh, chickpeas here, some fresh parsley, fresh basil, some rainbow chard that has been picked from our garden this morning, nice creamy burrata. These are le leafy lemons from the Amalfi Coast. Moving on to the main course, we've got some beautiful ribeye steak, Hereford beef, uh, trapea onions, pickled walnuts, um, garlic, Maris Piper potatoes, watercress, some walnuts, some thyme, and then onto the dessert we've got some beautiful strawberries, uh, panna cotta made with used milk yogurt, some lemon thyme, a crumble made from extra virgin olive oil, a little bit of icing sugar and some more lemon. So Banquist provide 99% of what you need to make this menu, um, but here are some extra bits of equipment and preparation that you'll need to get ready. So starting over here, we've got some mixing bowls, a microplane or a fine uh, grater, extra virgin olive oil, sea salt, uh, some butter, a couple of roasting trays, a wooden spatula, two um, nice frying pans, one large saucepan, one chopping board, and this is icing sugar with a little strainer. It's like a mini sieve, but you could use a, a normal sieve. Um, yeah. So firstly, we've got this lovely piece of ribeye, which has um, come to you in a vacuum packed bag. So uh, because it's been in a bag, it might be a little bit sweaty or bloody. So we'll just take it out of the bag. And then once it's come out of the bag, we're just gonna dab it off a little bit, uh, pat it dry, with some kitchen roll and put it back onto this tray. And we want it to come up to room temperature. And I'm also gonna just season it lightly now just to kind of firm it up a little bit and just start the seasoning process. We'll season it again later before we put it in the pan. So just a light seasoning. And then we'll let that come up to room temperature. Okay, so to toast the walnuts, we need to preheat the oven to 180 degrees. I'm gonna do that now. So next up, we're gonna prepare the strawberries for the, um, for the dessert. And we just, all we wanna do is macerate them in a little bit of lemon juice and icing sugar, and then set them to the side. And over time, it will just, uh, the lemon juice will just bring out the juices of the strawberries and it will almost make like a little compote but with a little bit more freshness because it hasn't been cooked. So make sure your, your, your strawberries are washed and we're just gonna cut them into a dice. So for this, you need about 10 strawberries. So what I'll do first, um, just to work neatly, is I'll just hold them. That's to take off the uh, green parts. 
a little tip for you here. If you if you don't want to throw these away, and you you can marinate these in a little bit of um, white wine vinegar to make like a, a fruity strawberry style vinegar, which is really nice with, in dressings. Okay, so that's perfect for two people. Just dice them up. They don't need to all be exactly the same size. It's actually quite nice for this to have a little bit of texture. Also, it doesn't matter if some of the strawberries in transit have become a little bit soft because you're gonna end up with a slightly softened strawberry anyway once the lemon juice has done its work. So I'm just cutting them in half this way. Cut them again that way. And then basically going again. So cutting them into eight pieces. My favorite fruit to cook with um, I love cooking with quinces and apples and pears when, when they're in season. Um, and I, I, do I, I do absolutely adore strawberries, peaches, but I have a bit of a thing about fruit where when you've got something as amazing as strawberry is in, in its natural state, I'm sort of reluctant to ever cook it because I feel like with a perfect strawberry or a perfect peach, as soon as you manipulate it or change it or cook it, it becomes almost a lesser version of what it is when it's like this um, but when a uh, when a when a really good peach is at its best it can it can, uh, can blow your mind I think there's a famous restaurant in California called uh, Chez Panisse where the chef is very she's got a very similar philosophy to to us but she's a lot more extreme in her sort of approach to kind of simplicity and using um, seasonal ingredients and one of the desserts at her restaurant is just a perfect peach on a plate. I think that's cool. Really Couldn't get away with that at Banquist. But... <laughs> how many peaches do you actually go through day to get those? Yeah, how many did she throw away? <laughs> okay, so I've got the diced strawberries here and I'm just going to use about a third of a lemon. I just want to squeeze the lemon juice in. Every last drop and then I'm just gonna dust over about a good tablespoon of icing sugar we don't want it to be too sweet so once you've added the uh, lemon juice and icing sugar just take a spoon give them a little mix that's just gonna help the icing sugar dissolve and you're gonna create basically a little sort of strawberry jus, which is gonna mix with the pieces of strawberries. And that's gonna be your compote. You don't need to put these in the fridge, just leave them to the side until they're ready, until you're ready to serve the dessert. So I'm just gonna place the walnuts in the oven at 180 degrees for about six minutes. While the walnuts are cooking, I'm gonna to start to prepare the onions. So these are amazing um, red Florence or Tripea onions. Um, we grow these onions here and we call them red Florence onions, but um, if you get them in Italy, they're from Calabria, uh, a place called Tripea, and it, their origin is protected. So they're allowed to call them Tripea onions only if they're from Calabria. This is a Tripea style onion um, and they're characteristically really uh, much sweeter and juicier than a normal onion um, it's kind of like the king of the king of onions uh, so I'm just going to um, leave the root intact cut the onion in half and at this stage I don't worry too much about taking the skin off so we're going to do that later when it's cooked and the idea of keeping the root and the skin on is we want to keep the onion as intact as possible while it's cooking so get your pan, frying pan here, nice and hot. You almost want it to be smoking hot when the onions go in. I'm just cutting the onions in half lengthways like that with the root intact. Take some olive oil and just put a nice film of oil on the bottom of your frying pan, like this. And now you see that it's starting to smoke a little bit. I'm just gonna add the onions this way down okay so cut side bottom of the pan
okay? And we're gonna cook the onions on a high heat for about three or four minutes. And then we're just gonna turn the heat down to, um, to medium. And um, we're gonna cook them on a medium heat until they're just cooked through. But they don't, don't wanna be super soft, but you don't wanna have any bite either. You just wanna use the spoon to check the color. What you wanna have is a nice, even golden color on the onions. Not burnt, but nice, deep golden brown. Okay, so I'm gonna turn the heat down now. And I'm gonna let them cook gently over a medium heat until they're just cooked. Okay, so these onions are gonna take a little bit of time to cook. So while they're roasting, I'm gonna start making the uh, walnut pesto. So ingredients for the walnut pesto. We've got some parsley, flat leaf parsley. These beautiful dark pickled uh, walnuts. Olive oil. The walnuts that are toasting in the oven. And some uh, sea salt. So first things first, I'm just gonna remove the parsley leaves from the stems. Separate those. And I keep, always keep these stalks just in case I'm making a stock or a broth. We don't want to waste anything. Just take the leaves off one by one. And use about half of this parsley. So, just before I chop the parsley, I'm just gonna put this cloth underneath my chopping board so that the board stays nice and steady when I'm chopping. Like this. And then to chop the parsley, just bunch it together, keeping your fingers away from the knife. Just wanna slice, rock the knife back and forwards, and slice it as thinly as you can. And then we're gonna go back over the parsley with the knife a couple of times and then it's good to go. It doesn't need to be too fine for this pesto. Okay, so now we're just gonna rock the knife back and forth over the parsley. It takes about one and a half minutes to get it to the right. One of my favorite chefs is uh, Alice Waters, who is a restaurant in California called Chez Panisse. Um, in the UK, I'm a big fan of uh, Fergus Henderson, who um, founded the St. John, St. John restaurant. Alan Passard in Paris. Okay, so the walnuts have come out of the oven. And you can see they're nicely toasted, golden brown. You don't want to take them any further than this. Six minutes is enough. Otherwise, they can start to get a little bit bitter when they're too heavily roasted, the walnuts. So we'll let those cool down a little bit. So I'm just gonna check the onions with a spoon and that's the color that we're looking for, actually. So this one's ready. The other ones just need a little bit longer. So you can see that's a little bit less golden. So, um, but it's not a very high heat. So they're just gonna carry on cooking gently while I finish the pesto. Um, so the parsley's chopped. I'm gonna start by putting the parsley into the bowl. and take a couple of these walnuts. So these walnuts have got this really sweet umami, almost like a black olive flavor, but with a sour acidity. Um, and we, we pick walnuts, generally we pick them in, in late May, in June, and then we preserve them in a salty brine. So salt and water, a little bit of sugar. And then that lasts about a month, and then after that, the walnuts are pickled in like a sweet malt vinegar brine. So I'm just chopping them up. They're already quite soft. 
again just cutting it in lengthways three times and then just dicing them in the opposite sense. So pickled walnuts are actually made using walnuts which are whole in their shell when they're green so they're unripe um, and that's what they look like basically. You've got the walnut inside but it also includes the shell that the walnut's in. But at the point when these are picked and pickled is straight from the tree and the shell is still green. It's best to do them with the young walnuts which are picked straight from the tree because the, uh, the shell is still soft basically. It's almost like a completely different product to the walnuts that you, that you eat like this. Okay, so there's two whole walnuts there. Mix that in with the parsley. Okay, so with these walnuts, I'm just gonna first crush them a little bit with the knife, break them down. And then just go gently over with the knife like so. Just rocking the knife back and forwards, keeping your eyes on your fingers so you don't cut yourself. And you want the walnuts to be roughly the same size as the pickled walnuts. And then once I add this to the mixture, it's just gonna be a little bit of olive oil, a little bit of salt, and then we're gonna put that to the side until we're ready to eat the steak. Another way of doing this would be just to put the uh, pickled walnuts and the roasted walnuts straight into a blender, adding the olive oil, and then you could put that into a bowl and uh, fold the chopped parsley through it. But I think it's a nice way to do everything by hand. Not everyone's got a blender either. Just putting the walnuts into the bowl. Okay. You add a little pinch of salt and a decent amount of extra virgin olive oil. And just enough to give it a pesto consistency. You want it to be nice and yeah. So I'm just gonna give it a little taste just to check the seasoning, the acidity is right. Tiny bit more salt. So it just tasted a little bit under 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 seasoned, basically, um, but generally really good. You got the nuttiness from the toasted walnuts, got the depth and acidity from the pickled walnuts, and the nice grassy freshness from the parsley and the olive oil. So it should look like this, no wetter, um, and we can just leave this to the side until we're ready to carve the beef. So, just take a look, look at the onions. You can see they've got a nice golden color. That's the color that we're going for. I'm just gonna take the onions out of the pan, put them onto the roasting tray. Look at that. They smell so sweet and delicious. So as you can see, we've got a nice little char on the edges of the onions. Um, and the char is really going to contrast with the sweetness of the onion. It's going to balance out the sweetness a little bit. But what you've got here is you've only got the face of the onion that has that color on it. So what we're going to do is we're going to separate the petals. So you'll have a cooked petal and it's just the outside of the petal that will look slightly charred. Um, but the, the, the bitterness that we get from the charredness is going to be balanced by the acidity from the uh, pickled walnut liquid. So I'm gonna leave them to the side for now, let them cool down. Okay, so next up, we're gonna prepare the potatoes, um, which we're gonna put in the oven. So it's like a lovely roasted rustic potatoes, perfect accompaniment for the beef. Uh, once the potatoes come out of the oven, we're gonna finish them with lots of garlic and fresh parsley, a little squeeze of lemon juice. So for now, all we're gonna do is cut them into pieces. And we're gonna put them in this pan that we cook the onions in so they get all the lovely flavor of the sweet onions. Um, and so they're gonna cook in the oil that the onions have been cooked in. So just take the potato, cut it in half, 
once and again. And then one more time. So you've got nice sort of boat, boat-like shapes of potato. And then straight into the pan. And we're gonna, just putting them in the pan um, flat side down. Uh, and then they're gonna roast in the oven for a bit. And then at some point we're gonna turn them over so the other flat side is facing down. So they get a really nice golden color on both sides. So once again, in half, into quarters, and then into eighths. Or if you want, you don't have to use this pan if you've got a nice roasting tray, just lots of olive oil, put the potatoes face down on the tray and straight into the 180 degree oven, which is already hot from toasting the walnuts. Okay, flat side down in a nice circle, and then I'm just gonna drizzle a nice amount of olive oil over the top. Season them with salt. And then into the oven, we're gonna do about 15, 20 minutes on one side, 15, 20 minutes on the other side. Okay, so I'm about to prepare the uh, garnish for the starter. Uh, and we're gonna make the uh, rainbow chard and chickpeas. So this is incredible uh, rainbow chard, freshly picked from our garden this morning. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna separate the stems from the leaves. And the reason for doing that is because the, uh, the stems are a bit more fibrous, they take a bit longer to cook than the leaves. So we want the stems to be really nice and soft and melted. And we want the leaves to stay nice and green and nice and fresh. So we're gonna start wilting the stems and once they're cooked, then we're gonna add the leaves in. So first, just separate, put the leaves back on the plate, take the stems off. Okay. Now take the stems, and we're just gonna chop it up like that. It can be pretty rough. As long as it's nicely cooked, Look at those beautiful colors. So, just gonna turn the pan up. I'm gonna add a nice film of olive oil on the bottom of the pan, about this much. Gonna get that oil nice and hot. Add the charred stems, and then turn the heat down a little bit, and then I'm gonna start shredding the green leaves. So now the oil is nice and hot, I'm just gonna add the charred stems into the oil. You hear that sizzle? You don't want to get any color on the charred stems at all. You just want them to sweat, almost melted down like a, like a sort of compote. So that's why I turn the heat down a little bit. Um, give them a nice toss. And while they're cooking, I'm just going to take the leaves and cut the leaves down the middle. Stick them on top of each other like that. Okay. And now I'm just going to Shred the leaves. Doesn't need to be too fine. You want to have a little bit of texture, a little bit of body in there. Make sure these aren't coloring, so low heat. Watch your fingers. Again, just really nice, gentle slice on the leaves. Try not to crush them too much using a gliding motion with the knife. Okay. I'll put these back on the plate for a minute. So these just need to cook slowly. So there's not much you can do at this point. You just want to wait for these to melt down before we add the charred leaves. Maybe pour yourself a nice glass of wine. Um, and once, uh, once the stems are cooked and the leaves have been added, we're then going to add in the chickpeas. We're just gonna bash them about a little bit so the outside of the chickpeas just break down and take on all the flavor of the lovely olive oil. After that, we're gonna season it with some lemon zest, lemon juice, and a little bit of extra virgin olive oil. My top tips for you know people wanting to grow their own food is to educate yourself, um, you know, not on a super serious level, but to you know watch YouTube videos, read a few books because 
my experience, gardening can be quite unforgiving. You know, you, you kind of need to have a rough idea of what you're doing, but at the same time, you also learn from your mistakes. So just get it, you know, just getting your hands a bit dirty, trying things out, and if something goes wrong, look it up, watch a video, read a book. Um, that, that's how I learn. And I think the best way to learn is, is definitely by, by doing. So I actually find that one of the easiest vegetables to grow um, is rainbow chard. And it looks beautiful. And it's one of those things as well that like, in terms of the uh, effort you put in, planting it, sowing the seeds, the sort of the reward that you get out, the quantity of rainbow chard, it's one of those things that you can cut it and come back and pick it again. Um, and, it, and it grows for most of the year as well. So um, it would be a good thing to start. So now you've got the uh, cooked down stems a little bit. Um, they should be nice and soft. I'm just gonna add in the leaves. I'm just gonna stir it with a wooden spoon. I'll keep my eye on it, it's on a low heat, but all I want is for the leaves to start to wilt down a little bit. And then I'm gonna add the chickpeas. So the stems have been in for about six minutes before we put the leaves in. I'm just gonna add a little bit of salt. Another glug of olive oil. So these are tin chickpeas, and what I've done is I've just rinsed them in a sieve under a tap, because generally when you open a tin of chickpeas, you tend to have this kind of like slimy water. And if I added that into the pan now, you'd get this kind of sort of slimy mass. So it's, it's important to make sure that you rinse them so they've just got a nice plump chickpeas. In we go. Give them a good stir. And just by stirring them like this, because the chickpeas are because the chickpeas are nice and soft, just by stirring them like this, I'm starting to break them down and smash them up a little bit. Can you see that? So I'm gonna cook that for one more minute and then I'm gonna transfer it into a bowl and then we're gonna season it. Okay, so chickpeas are nice and uh, well mixed with the chard and the edges are starting to break a little bit as I uh, stir it around with the wooden spoon. I'm just gonna pop this into this bowl Now I want to add the uh, zest of these lovely unwaxed Amalfi lemons um, and we're also going to use the juice. So microplane or the finest grater that you have. In goes the zest and that's going to give it a lovely fragrance, a lovely freshness. It's just going to lift it to another dimension. Wow, what an amazing smell. This is one of my favorite dishes to make at home. Okay, so the zest of the lemon. Now, just cut that in half. And you see these seeds in here? I'm just gonna use the tip of the knife to remove the seeds. So when I squeeze it in, if there's any extra seeds that manage to fall in, it's no problem, we'll just pick them out, but there we go. Now, squeeze the lemon. Give that a nice mix. Nice bit more olive oil, fresh olive oil. Another pinch of salt. Mix it again. I'm just gonna taste it so I can check the uh, seasoning, check the acidity, see if it needs anything else. Tiny bit more salt. A little bit more lemon. And another good glug of olive oil. You can never have too much olive oil. Okay, so just giving that a nice, a nice toss. 
Now we want to just leave that to sit at room temperature until we're ready to eat the salad. So now it's time to turn the potatoes over. So you can see that they're nice and blistered on one side and they should be lovely and golden on the other side. Yeah, nice, that's perfect. I'm just turning each one over onto the other side and I give them another 15 minutes in the oven and then they're good to go. Try not to burn my fingers while I'm doing it. Okay, ready to go back in the oven for another 10, 15 minutes. Okay, so now it's time to finish the starter. I'm just gonna take the burrata out of the packet this is amazing burrata, this so creamy. You can really taste the quality of the uh, amazing dairy. How soft that is. So, I'll let that sit for a minute. And then I'm just gonna give this one last mix. Make a little pile on the plate. go spread it out a little bit beautiful okay so the burrata I'm gonna take my knife and I'm gonna cut it straight down the middle again I don't want to apply too much pressure so I'm gonna use a nice sliding motion so I don't squash it Look how lovely and creamy that is. I'm just gonna put that this way. The burrata on top, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna finish it with the nicest, smallest, freshest little uh, basil leaves. God, they smell amazing, this basil. Can break them up a little bit if they're too big. Okay, so you're just looking for the leaves that are in the middle. Can break them up a little bit. Go. I'm just going to finish it with a little pinch of sea salt and a little drizzle of olive oil. Nice. So there we have it. Braised rainbow chard with chickpeas, burrata and fresh basil. Okay, so we've just finished the uh, delicious burrata starter. Now we're gonna move on to our main course. Um, we've got some things here that we've prepared earlier. The salsa, the lovely roasted onions, the steak which is up at room temperature, some bits here just for finishing the steak, and I've got the potatoes in the oven which I'm gonna pull out now and I'm just gonna finish the potatoes before we start to cook the steak. Okay, so potatoes, nice and golden. So they've been in the oven for about 15 minutes on one side and then about 15, 20 minutes on the other side. You can see that they're lovely and golden, shiny. Um, so I'm just gonna finish them with a little bit of grated garlic. So this is like half a clove of, clove of garlic. Just scrape that in and just a little handful of roughly chopped parsley, some salt, and a little squeeze of lemon juice. This is really nice rustic roast potatoes. 
al forno, just like they do in Italy. Sprinkle the parsley over the potatoes. A little bit of seasoning. Squeeze of lemon. And then just mix it all together. Get that garlic, all the lovely oil, the parsley, the lemon juice. Delicious. We're just gonna set this to the side while we start to cook our steak. For the steak, need a nice hot pan, smoking hot, super important. I've got a little bit of butter, some garlic cloves that are chopped in half, some lovely thyme, and just gonna get this pan nice and hot. Okay, so we're gonna get ready to cook the steak. We've already seasoned it a little bit to bring out some of the moisture earlier. I'm just gonna give it one more little seasoning before it goes in the pan. With steak I find you always need slightly more salt than you think is necessary. Um, get the pan absolutely roasting hot. Oil to start with. Get the steak. Flat side down into the pan. And what we wanna get is a really, really nice crust, a really nice sear, beautiful golden color. It's gonna take about three minutes on either side. And then we're gonna finish it in the oven at 180 degrees for a couple of minutes. And again, we're looking for a medium, medium rare finish on the steak. Obviously, if your steak is a little bit fatter, it might take a little bit longer to cook. Equally, if you have a slightly flatter steak, you might wanna reduce the time by a minute or so on either side. So while that's cooking, I'm just gonna carry on preparing my onions, taking the stem off the bottom, removing the outer layer. Okay, I'm just gonna check the steak. Make sure it's nice and golden. You see that? Just a little bit more on this side. Turn the heat up a little bit, believe it or not. And then I'm gonna flip it over and I'm gonna add the butter, the thyme and the garlic. I'm gonna baste it a little bit. A ribeye is one of my absolute favorite cuts of beef because you've got the lovely uh, marbled meat in the center, but all this intermuscular fat that makes it just extra tender, extra juicy. Okay, nice. So, let's check it one more time. So that's the sort of caramelization that we're looking for. So I'm gonna flip it over. Add the butter. Thyme. Some garlic. And then, using my spoon, just gonna baste the steak for a minute or so. Get that lovely thyme on top, get all the flavor in there. Beautiful. There's nothing quite like basting a ribeye steak. Okay, so we've got a nice sear on the steak. I'm gonna take this tray, remove the steak, Turn the pan off. Keep this lovely garlic. So the beef is out of the pan now. We're gonna put it back into the oven for three minutes along with the roasted onions and the potatoes that we prepared earlier. Okay, so the steak has come out of the oven. I'm just gonna check it. So we want it to be medium. A little bit medium rare is okay, but um, personally, because you've got the intermuscular fat and the different, some different muscles in there, I think medium is a nice cut, a nice cooking to make it lovely and tender. 
So that looks perfect to me. Uh, I just want it to feel a little bit firm, not too squidgy, and we're gonna let it rest um, on the chopping board for about five minutes with the herbs on top, just taking all of that flavor, all of that lovely garlic while we finish the uh, rest of the dish. Okay, so onions out of the oven. And the potatoes. Got some fresh watercress. And here's the pesto that we made earlier. So with the onions, what I'm going to do is just separate the petals. So you've just got the charred bits on the edges, but you've got this lovely sweet onion in the middle. Okay, nice. So get ready to carve the steak. I'm just going to dress the salad with a little bit of olive oil, tiny bit of salt. So in total, we've cooked this beef for about 10 minutes. And what we want to do normally as a rule is, is to try and let the meat rest for as long as we've cooked it. Um, so I can still feel that it's a little bit hot. Um, and by leaving it to, to rest properly, it will allow the, the blood and the juices to sort of distribute itself uh, between the different muscle fibers and relax a little bit. Um, and if I didn't let the, re the meat rest, it might be a little bit undercooked but it would also um, be kind of dripping with juice when I go to carve it. Um, and I don't think it would be quite as tender and succulent as if it had rested properly. So I'm gonna carve the steak. And when I carve it, I'm gonna carve it onto this piece of pepper just to absorb any excess juice or blood that might come out of it. Wow, look at that. That is a, what a medium steak looks like. Perfectly pink, not too bloody, not too chewy, most importantly. You wanna have a bit of chew, but above all, you want the meat to be really, really nice and tender. Okay. So, just spread the meat out on the plate. This bit is a slightly um, fattier piece. And then I just take a few onions. Place them on top. These lovely sweet onions. Beef and onions is one of my absolute flavor, favorite flavor combinations. Okay, so, got the beef and the onions on the plate. And now I'm just gonna add some little blobs of my uh, pickled walnut, uh, parsley, pesto. So think of this almost like a, uh, a British chimichurri. And then just to freshen it up, I'm gonna pick some of the nicest watercress leaves. To finish, get these lovely roasted potatoes on the side. And there we have it. Roasted ribeye of beef with onions, pickled walnut salsa, and watercress. A lovely side of country roasted potatoes.
Okay, so now we've come to plate up the dessert. Um, a couple of things that we've prepared in advance. This is a panna cotta made from um, sheep's milk yogurt. And what we've done is basically warms the sheep's milk yogurt and dissolved a little bit of gelatine into it and then finished it with some lightly whipped cream. And then that's left to set overnight. So you've got a really nice kind of moussey, slightly um, custardy texture. And then this is a crumble. So it's uh, flour, a little bit of thyme, uh, some sugar, some butter, and some extra virgin olive oil. It's just been rubbed together until you've got these lovely little clusters. Um, so I'm just gonna start by putting a little bit of the uh, crumble on the plate. And then using a hot spoon, uh, so it's a spoon that's just sitting in some hot water. Uh, we're gonna take a really nice scoop of the panna cotta and put it on top of the crumble. Lovely. And then using the back of the spoon, I'm just gonna make a little groove in the top of the uh, panna cotta. And I'm gonna fill that groove with some of these beautiful strawberries. They've just been macerated with lemon juice, icing sugar, still kind of retaining their texture, but I've got a really nice coating from the uh, icing sugar, which has brought out the juice of the strawberries. And just finished with a few leaves of lemon thyme. Just finished with a little touch of olive oil. There we go. There we have it. A lovely panna cotta of used milk yogurt with olive oil biscuit strawberries and lemon thyme. My favorite crisp flavor is cheese and onion. Yeah. Fan fancy cheese and onion. Fancy cheese? Yeah, mature cheddar and onion. <laughs> yeah. I'm a big kettle chip fan. My final death row meal would be uh, steak tartare with fritz, a Negroni, and maybe a sticky toffee pudding. Mm. It's a bit of a weird combo, isn't it? My favorite restaurant is probably a place in France called La Grenouillère um, or the River Cafe in London. I love the simplicity of the River Cafe. I love the sort of feeling of excitement in the dining room, the feeling of being somewhere special, and also being somewhere a little bit out of the way where I wouldn't normally go. My three dinner guests, dead or alive, would be Vladimir Putin, A.A. Gill, and Bob Marley. I thought that would make a really, really cool combination. Why Putin? Just to throw a bit of just to throw a bit of edge in there. <laughs> <laughs> if I wasn't a chef, I'd definitely be focusing on growing vegetables and rearing livestock. <laughs> <laughs>